do want to go back to to Marty, uh, some of Marty's final points here, at least in terms of where we're going. But uh, there's several pieces here to catch uh, catch up on uh, during since the last week. And if I can advance here, there we go. I'm going to start with temperature over the last week. And uh, again, as it's been typical much of the season, we've been either above or below. And, and of course, things average out close to the normal. But uh, with the numbers here, looking at the last week, they range from really close to the climatological normals in northern parts of the state to a couple degrees warmer than normal across the south. You can see for much of the Midwest here on the lower left, or on the left-hand side here, that it was a warmer than normal week. Uh, and and uh, that, that trend has been similar. Now, on the right-hand side here, I've included the uh, base 50 degree day totals. This is the total beginning uh, in, uh, on May 1 through the, well, this is through the 5th. And you can see the pattern in Michigan uh, is, it's been similar over the last few weeks. And that is, we've got a little bit of a deficit in the far northern part of the state across upper Michigan and across the far northern lower. But for most of the state, uh, most of the lower peninsula, especially the far south, we have a surplus. And that, that pattern we have seen uh, here again for, for some time now. So uh, in terms of calendar days, uh, a couple days behind normal in the far north to several days to maybe as much as a week in, again, in terms of heat accumulation in the far south. And as you, you can also see here for uh, a good chunk of the Eastern Corn Belt, we are also running a surplus there. Uh, and then that decreases as you go westward. Uh, the, the, I think the more important issue here in uh, looking at, at, well, the recent past, and really the last several weeks here is, is moisture. And I, I think that's where most people's concern is at the present time, but it, it, it just, it depends completely on where you are in location. Uh, these are rainfall totals for the last week, note through just yesterday morning. And two areas, well, there's actually three areas here that are really important, I think, to, to look at. But one is that uh, there are two areas, that it's the haves and the have nots. And we have two areas, uh, notably, that have uh, picked up heavy precipitation over the last week. You can see that's true across much of western and central upper Michigan here. Uh, two to four inches of rain fell there. And that, a lot of that fell last week. But uh, just as notable here, down in the southwestern part of the lower peninsula, uh, there was a, a cluster of, actually two groups of thunderstorms that went through here. You can see all the way from southern Minnesota across southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, into far southwestern lower and nor uh, Michigan and then northern Indiana. And some of these thunderstorms trained, basically moved across the same spot repeatedly. And uh, we had reports in uh, the largest report I've seen so far, uh, just to the east of Constantine was just under four inches for, uh, and that would be for a 24 hour va value. And that's, that's real for Michigan climatologically, that's really, really heavy. It's also important to know, and you can see that here actually with the uh, red color. And for the weekly total, they had precipitation actually before that, back um, on Monday and into Tuesday. So the weekly total here in some portions of Southwestern Lower, you can see especially Cass in St. Joseph County here, exceeded five and in some cases six inches. And another reason that that is notable is because this area was too dry. Uh, just just before that, and, and some similarities with last year to many locations that had long periods of extended dryness early in the summer, and then we had uh, just a complete flip-flop that occurred during the middle and latter part of the season. Well, that, that's, that certainly has happened in Southwest. Now, there's another area here which also we have to talk about, and that is the Central Lower Peninsula, uh, where you see here in the blues, less than half an inch, in some cases less than a quarter of an inch. Uh, that's a large, uh, fairly large area here, again, across the central portion, uh, and also less precipitation in portions of southern lower Michigan than, than fell in the southwest. And this, uh, unfortunately, this dates back into the month of May. What I've got here are totals from the last two months. This is May and June together. Uh, these are the observed totals here on the left. And again, uh, much of this area here you can see around uh, four inches or so, which is a little bit more than half of normal. And, uh, and uh, there's another another piece of this that, that I'll get to in just a second. But uh, the, the issue is, is that we've had some several weeks of extended dryness in many areas of the state. And it's, uh, it's most, I think, most acute in central and at some case, well, in, in many portions of, of uh, lower Michigan, but the central, even portions of northern lower Michigan, 
and then even portions of southern uh, lower Michigan as well that, that were not affected by the rainfall. And it's, it's, it's been, again, for several weeks. The is other issue that we've talked about, and it's, I just don't, we can't overemphasize enough, is that not only has the rainfall been below normal for several weeks, but the potential of apotranspiration, the evaporative demand for water has been much above normal. So at the same time, we don't get enough in these areas that have not gotten enough rainfall. The atmospheric demand for the water has been above normal, which acts to uh, hasten the onset of stress or, or uh, accelerate stress symptoms. And you can see that here. This is for East Lan or for Lansing. Michigan is actually using East Lansing uh, in viral weather data for the potential of apotranspiration. But normal rainfall here, this is back to the beginning of June. Uh, through 4th of July here, about four inches. They've had uh, about an inch and a half in that time frame, so a little bit less than half of the rainfall. But again, the important thing is here, the red line, almost seven inches of potential. What does that mean? Well, if the water were there, that's how much would evaporate. Of course, it wasn't there. Uh, the, the, the soils were... So what you see, the actual water use is much less than this, but that that is a problem because it means that the crop is essentially for portions of the day, we see stress show up, uh, it shuts down, it does not uh, photosynthesis, does not uh, translocate photosynthate and, and do what it's supposed to be doing, it misses opportunity. And that, that of course, adds up. The, the good news is, is a lot of this is occurring during the vegetative part of the crop, uh, which is if you're going to have some stress, that's probably when you want to happen. But in the next couple of weeks, our crops will be moving into reproductive stages, and then it becomes a different story and much more complicated. We'll need to have water by then. But it's something we're watching carefully. And again, this, this year, this uh, especially the month of June, uh, has been an odd one because, again, many areas had drier than normal conditions with that uh, accelerated PET. Soil moisture levels as a result of this have dropped off dramatically in many areas. Uh, this is one from the, on the left-hand side here, soil moisture as of the beginning of May. And then as a, a comparison, uh, the 6th of, Ju of July, and you can see the introduction of lots of this brown and orange color. Those are bad on this one. It indicates, again, th these are uh, soil moisture in the top three feet expressed in terms of a percentile. And you can see that for large portion, not just Michigan, but note also here, large portions of the Corn Belt have, have had similar conditions. They're down in that uh, 10 percentile or so, indicating again that this, uh, this uh, status of soil moisture occurs only once about every 10 years at this time of the year on average. So it's, it's, uh, it's fairly unusual for, to see soil moisture that low at this time of the year. Uh, one last one here that uh, again some other other indices here. The U.S. Drought Monitor should be noted here that this one is it's still this is dated, but uh, we have rapidly seen the onset of drought conditions or dryness, abnormal dryness, uh, and you can see the D zero across portions of central and northern lower Michigan here, about 24 percent of the of the state by area at that point in time. That will definitely change. Uh, we have a new uh, a new version of this or an updated version of this coming here a little bit later this morning. But the two I want to really show I think are important are the ones on the bottom, the quick drought response. This is a, a remotely sensed derived index and it looks at ground temperature and, and looks at the evaporation of water. It also is very, very good at picking up areas that change rapidly. And I think out of all these, this, this is an important one because it does show how quickly the landscape has dried out. In, uh, in major portions of Michigan. Now, no, this goes through the third. It does not have all the heavy rain that occurred in the southwestern part of the state. Of course, that would change this. Uh, on the right-hand side here, this is the vegetative drought response. This is actually looking at, at the temperature of, of vegetation and how it's responding. And you can see, again, a lot of brown color has developed here. That's, again, stressed vegetation. There's not enough water in the soil to supply the needs of the plant, at least during the daytime. Uh, we can see most of these areas that, uh, that that changes at nighttime. Two things here locally in our area that are, that are evident as we go out and look at crops here, especially the corn and soybeans, and that is that you can see definite differences with soil. Coarse textured soils, which do not hold as much water or have as much water available to plants, those are where you see the most, of course, the stress most readily. Soils that hold more water are less stressed. The other thing that's notable too is that late planted corn and soybeans, relatively late planted corn and soybeans, uh, have been hit harder by this dryness than have earlier planted. We, you can see differences in both of those here locally, but it certainly is, is showing up in many areas. We had a half an inch here locally 
uh, with the rain the night before last. That helped a great deal. But uh, as you'll see here, that's only a couple days worth of uh, potential evapotranspiration given where we are at this time of the year. So where are we headed? Uh, looking at the forecast here, uh, we're, we're looking at actually some, some fairly decent outdoor weather to be if you want to be outside uh, here for most of the state. But most of the, the action, most of the storm track here, at least for the foreseeable, the near-term future, is going to be to our south. And uh, the first system is actually moving through right now. You can see in the radar time lapse here, the national big area of thunderstorms over here in uh, Iowa, northern Missouri. That's going to come close. We might see some of that precipitation brush, brush the far southwestern port of this portion of the state again. But with high pressure blocked here over Canada, and it's a Canadian high pressure system, uh, mostly a fair dry weather expected for the vast majority of the state. So we'll call it a, a chance of a stray shower or thunder shower in the extreme south today, but most of the state will be uh, basically fair, dry, and relatively warm. Uh, temperatures in the low, maybe a few mid 80s in the far south, and then the upper 70s as you go north from that, but a, a, a really a fairly decent day here with most of the activity remaining south. By tomorrow, you can see that system uh, as it approaches here into central Illinois uh, with a large amount of rain. Right now, that looks like, again, most of that will stay to the south of Michigan. You can also see a frontal boundary, a cool front, it does pass through the state. Typically, that would be something we'd look at for precipitation. It is in this case, but again, most of the moisture with this probably will stay just south. We'll, we'll have to keep an eye and it could shift further north. But right now, it looks as though we will see the chance with the system of showers and thunderstorms. Uh, well, statewide, really, but mostly across southern portions of the state by late, uh, late in the day today into tomorrow and then into early Saturday. But uh, uh, again, best chances for any rain, any meaningful rain will be across the far south, mainly south of I-94, uh, probably looking at a couple tenths or less and certainly less than that as you go farther north. Note here, uh, again, by tomorrow morning, another Canadian high pressure system moving into the state. That's uh, a pattern that uh, we're looking at and probably gonna be seeing going into the next week. Here's Saturday morning high pressure firmly in control over the state and uh, setting up what will be very a, a beautiful weekend to be outdoors a little bit cooler. Highs in the 70s generally north uh, to near 80 in the south, lows in the 40s and 50s. So actually a couple of degrees below normal here, uh, relatively dry air, low humidity. Uh, it'll be very, very pleasant to be outside, mostly sunny conditions. Uh, and after tomorrow, the next chance for any rain probably not coming until the beginning of next week. And that will be sort of a statewide, it'll start in the Northwest and then shift uh, uh, late Sunday night into Monday and then shifting South into the rest of the state by Monday into early Tuesday. Doesn't look like a major rainfall producer at this point in time, but that's that will be the next chance for rain that we have. Uh, but as we look ahead here, it looks like another drier than normal week. And you can see this, these are precip totals for the upcoming seven days and uh, the driest conditions right where we've had the driest or the last or least rainfall here across central in portions of uh, southern and southeastern lower Michigan, less than a quarter of an inch expected. Uh, that's probably, that's probably uh, not a bad forecast. Greater totals as you go to the far north and then again across the extreme southwestern corner of the state. Even with the cooler temperatures, our potential evapotranspiration rates for the upcoming week are still expected to be uh, moderate to higher than normal, generally about two tenths to about 22 hundredths of an inch per day over the next week. And these are the totals here, uh, as you can see uh, listed. A lot of that will be due to the sunny skies and the relatively low humidities, which are expected. Now back to Marty's point about, uh, about wetness duration and dew with this type, these Canadian orange and air masses, these are not known for producing long periods of dew. So if anything, we would expect here over the next at least several days and maybe longer than that, we would expect to see, yes, there still be dew, but probably will be out there less time uh, and let heavier, or lighter intensity than it typically is uh, as we move into the latter part of the summer. Finally, the uh, six to 10 and eight to 14 day outlooks here are both fairly consistent. If we look at the jet stream pattern here, it's important to note that this big upper air ridge, the heat dome and all of the problems that we've had with heat and stress and, and, uh, uh, war and once in a while it's, it's gotten up to Michigan, but mostly it has stayed south of us. Note that the axis of that ridge has shifted further west out into the western portions of the US. 
In turn, it's allowed a trough to develop over the eastern part of North America, which puts Michigan under northwesterly flow aloft. And you wonder, well, why are we have all these Canadian origin air masses moving out of Canada? And that, that's exactly why. It's uh, because these are the, the steering patterns for these. So the air masses that we're likely to see are out of the out of the high latitudes. They're cooler and drier than we typically see in the summer, and that leads to uh, basically one direction, and that's probably cooler than normal mean temperatures. Doesn't mean that it will be cold, but but certainly cooler than the averages. We're getting towards uh, the warmest time of the year. It also means uh, with lower lower amounts of moisture to work with, probably normal to below normal precipitation total. So a couple ways of looking at this especially as we look now towards, uh, again, crop stages more sensitive to moisture, where are we gonna get the water? Well, the, the not so good news is that this is not a pattern conducive for heavy precipitation across our part of the world. Uh, I think that goes without saying, at least for the next couple of weeks. So uh, we won't get the water in, in that way, at least not what's, not what's probably would, would be needed or would, that would be uh, certainly desirable. But it also means with cooler temperatures that there's less, a little bit less water demand evaporation from the atmosphere. The PET rates will be a little bit lower than they would be otherwise. And again, both six to 10 and eight to 14 day outlooks are in this direction, but they also suggest the guidance says that maybe we will see another upper air change then by the middle of, or the third week of the month to something different. And I, that, would be, that would be my guess is that we do see another change then. So summarizing, wrapping up here, Another, uh, again, we've got a variety of conditions across the state, given the recent rainfall, everything from way too little water to way too much, uh, de again, depending on the location. And we're, we're entering a period of cooler uh, and drier than normal conditions, probably for the majority of the next one to two weeks. That's the, the general consensus here uh, for, uh, again, in that medium range. And I'll stop there and see if, uh, well, we'll open it up or actually, let me go to introduce our next week's speaker. That's uh, that's more important here for now. And that's uh, Dan Bublitz, uh, who's going to be with us to talk about uh, so sugar bean cyst nematode management. Uh, timely topic here. So that's, again, that's one week from this morning, next virtual breakfast. And with that, I'll turn it back to, uh, to Lyndon.